The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll visit the Scattergood Hostel, where Quaker farmers kept a small band of refugees just out of Hitler's reach. Run on the dirt tracks of Iowa to see why it's more than a race for the checkered flag for these vintage stock car drivers. And hike the hills and trails of the Hawkeye State with Elizabeth Hill. Few of us will ever understand how the atrocities of World War II could have escalated to such extremes, or why many chose to turn a blind eye to them. And until recently, few of us knew that a small group of Iowans helped keep European refugees out of Hitler's reach. For the 1939 residents of West Branch, Iowa, this gravel lane served as the main route into town. But to European refugees trying to escape Hitler's tyranny, the dusty Iowa road was a path to safety. Basically, we're talking about Schindler's List on the prairie. The only difference is, is that everyone in the world knows about Oskar Schindler and the 1,100 Jews he saved in Middle Europe. Almost no one knows about the 185 refugees that Iowa Quaker farmers and college kids saved. From 1939 to 1943, nearly 200 refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe found a safe haven at Scattergood Hostel, a makeshift commune on the site of what had been a Quaker boarding school. Here, outside the small town of West Branch, Iowa Quakers hosted Jews as well as Hitler's political dissidents, offering them food, shelter, and a glimmer of light in the midst of Nazi darkness. Admittedly, 185 is a drop well, it's not even a drop in the bucket compared to six million people who perished at Auschwitz and Treblinka and all the other death camps. But 185 souls saved was more than what was being saved down the road. I mean, this story is a story, a remarkable story, of Iowa Quaker farmers and college students who had no connection with these people, had no obligation, and in many cases couldn't even correctly pronounce their names, but brought them over from Berlin and Prague and Vienna and Budapest and saved their lives. If the Quakers had not saved them, they would have all been killed at Auschwitz and gone up the chimney as ashes. But because of the bravery of some people, their lives were saved, people pretty much like you, actually. For author Michael Lewick Trams, the Scattergood story is an example of goodness during a time of hatred, a rarity in world history he feels compelled to share with everyone he can, from Quaker congregations to these Des Moines high school students. If you were a refugee, where would you go? Where would you find help? Who would help you? Most people don't do anything in most uh, areas of their lives to actively, ongoingly help someone else. You know, life is hard as it is. We don't want to be responsible or feel responsible for somebody else, so we turn the other way. Well, during the Third Reich, most people ignored these peoples who were trying to scurry out of harm's way. What's amazing is that the Iowa Quakers didn't. Like with getting to know a person, the more that you get to know about Scattergood Hostel, the more you realize this is exciting, this is life changing. If I involve myself in this, if I invest my, my heart, not just my head, but my heart in this story, it will change me. For Michael, pictures of Scattergood offer a glimpse into just how unique the hostel really was. In fact, you'd swear these to be snapshots of a peaceful family farm rather than images of a wartime refugee camp. Unlike most service agencies, which offered limited assistance during business hours only, Scattergood operated as a full-time commune, with each refugee staying an average of four months. 
Here, Quakers and Jews not only shared field work and daily chores, but also the tremendous burden of war's impact. Some of the people had been through great trauma. Some had known hunger, had been beaten. Some had been in Dachau. Another refugee would come down to the pantry at night and steal lard. He had known severe hunger in a camp and just eat lard to regain weight and to satisfy his hunger. But by that point, the hunger probably wasn't just physi physiological, it was also psychological. Some of the refugees arrived with children or spouses still back in Europe. Some of them would pace the hallway at night when they couldn't sleep, back and forth, back and forth. None of these 49 volunteers had had any training. They didn't know what post-traumatic syndrome was. They hadn't been instructed in psychology or in counseling, and yet they came and gave what they had the most of, which was vitality and enthusiasm, idealism and love. On a practical level, that love meant, I'm going to listen to your story even when I'm tired and I have five other things distracting me. Love means that when you're hurting, I'm strong enough to ask you what you're hurting about and will re really listen to the answer. There's something that all of us could do to help out the life of someone. While Quaker representatives in Europe helped refugees secure immediate needs like visas and passage money, Iowa Quakers, with their modest resources, channeled efforts into long-reaching acts of human kindness, opening their homes to the war-torn Europeans whose harrowing escapes had led them to the United States. In addition to therapeutic social activities, the Scattergood staff provided health care, language classes, and job training, hoping to give refugees, or guests as they were called, a foundation on which to rebuild their lives. They wanted these tattered and tired people to feel that they were worthy of respect. Even if they learned fabulous English and they could work wonders with a hammer and saw, if the people had not found their own centers, if they had not rediscovered themselves while well, at good, all the practical training in the world would not have made a big difference. When you're under that much attack, under that much stress, I think your soul goes on vacation. You have to vacate your life, your biography, your body, just to survive. At Scattergood Hostel, uh, people's souls, people's spirits could rejoin their bodies, the biographies. People could rest. The Quakers intended this a place to be where people could regather themselves, and indeed that's what happened. Of the 23 children who passed through Scattergood, all but three became either teachers, psychologists, or social workers, each demonstrating a desire to share the goodness found on the Iowa prairie. For the young guests, Scattergood was an introduction to Midwestern treats, like marshmallows and pony rides. But for 15-year-old Gunter Krauthammer, it was also a long-awaited return to serenity. After Hitler came to power, it was, a, it was a frightening situation, really. I knew I wasn't going to, I couldn't live in Germany. Uh, but you don't know where you're going to end up. So you, you have this, uh, this uncertainty because you don't know where you're going to go to school, you don't know where you're going to be when you grow up, uh, you don't know what's going to happen, and everything is always temporary. You don't know what to expect, and, and, and you don't make any plans, because uh, there's no point in making plans, because it's, everything is too unpredictable. So Scattergood made a huge impression on me, a very deep impression, and in retrospect, it sort of looms as a safe haven, I guess really the first one in my whole life that I had. And of course, when I came here, and that was back in 1942. And maybe some of your grandparents were, went to school here at that time. In May of 1998, Gunter, or George as he's now called, returned to West Branch for the first time in over 50 years, responding to letters from these middle school students who were studying Scattergood as part of their Holocaust unit. So we had to sort of sneak out of the country uh, by you know, going through some backwoods and uh, crawling out of some barbed wire with the help of somebody who guided us across the border. And I was very scared, I'll tell you. As a child in Hitler's Germany, this New Jersey professor of neuroscience tried to accept hardships as adventures, 
even attempting to view his dangerous escape into Belgium as a journey into a new land. But despite his self-proclaimed optimism, the complexities of having a German Christian mother and a Jewish father were often too overwhelming to comprehend. They were all marched to the edge of town and uh, most of them were shot and the others were put into uh, cattle cars and brought to a concentration camp. I see my Jewish uncle gets killed, my German uncle, of course, he survived during the war. I think it's important for anybody, or certainly for children, to realize that, uh, to know about it and to realize that such things can have happened and, in a sense, still happen in other places. Uh, and I think it actualizes uh, history to some extent. I think that's important. After class, a handful of students accompanied George on a visit to Scattergood, which has today returned to a Quaker boarding school. While most of the hostel's original buildings are long gone, the grounds still hold some of George's fondest memories, like the tree under which the 15-year-old refugee spent Iowa's hot summer nights, and the echoing spirit of the Quakers who forever changed his life. Scattergood somehow has meant a great deal to me, and I can't put it into words, you know. But it must have, because I, I've, I've constantly thought about it, and wherever I go, whatever it was, it was just a very unique uh, and powerful experience for me. It changed my life. In the beginning, Scattergood was created to counter the tragedies of racism, but ironically, it was racism itself that brought the hostel to a close. In later years, as the war in Europe escalated, it became nearly impossible for European refugees to find safe passage to Scattergood. The Iowa Quakers then turned their attention to Japanese Americans who had been forced into relocation camps. However, the West Branch residents, who had once embraced European refugees, now vehemently refused to accept Japanese Americans into their town. Unable to fight the town's protests, the Quakers were forced to close the hostel, bringing Scattergood's four-year path of light to a dark end. When you see athletes under 40 retiring for life, you begin to wonder if competition is meant for the young. But the senior stock car racers you're about to meet tell a different story. They'd be the first to tell you that competition is also meant for the young at heart. It's the thrill of it, I guess. My adrenaline still gets to pumping, guys, when I get in this thing. Just about every weekend, we race pretty hard this weekend. The competition. <laughs> Your brother, best friend, no matter who it is, if he's ahead of you, that's one car you're going to try and pass. I like speed. It brings back kind of your youth. When I was uh, younger, the uh, midgets were very popular and always wanted to drive the midgets. It's a thoroughbred race car. The spark in the hearts of these old timers keeps their motors running strong in a sport they've loved for decades. As our millennium odometers turn over to the year 2000, these stock cars from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s qualify as true antiques, and for the drivers are a blast from the past. Us older guys think we didn't get enough racing in when we were younger in the 50s. It was a rock 'em sock 'em thing then. If you didn't get upset once or twice a night, you wasn't even there. Bill ran three stories by us of his flirtations with disaster. One crash broke his back. Another wreck drove a piece of steel into his lung. And when his car flew off the track upside down and backwards... They finally did uh, get me aroused, and I walked to the ambulance. A very, very lucky person. So you, you really went through a bunch of cars. Of course, they were plentiful then. You could buy them for $15, $20 a piece. After 50 years of inflation, Bill has about 10 grand in his restored purple number four driven only in 1959 by Donnie Siskels. It sat in a barn until Bill recently resuscitated it, keeping the original color and number. As president of the Central Vintage Racing Association, Bill's enthusiasm is as revved up as his stock car. The club coordinated 26 events the summer of 1999. Some antique racing groups put on a show where the winners are predetermined. 
but this club voted to fly the checkered flag for the actual winners. We'll run between 80 and 100 mile an hour most of the time. I was clocked last year at 97. They think it's vintage, that we are slow. Our idea is race to win. The fellows that you run with, how close net you get. You need a hand, they're always there to help you, just like brothers. Some of the club racers really are brothers. Ed, here by his white Chevy number 79, is big brother to Bud, standing by his red Ford number 59. Having built many old stock cars together since the 1950s, they have stories to burn about the early days. Oh, years ago when we used to run the fairs on the old horse tracks, well, it was usually so dusty you couldn't see the 10 foot ahead of you. Today, there's a lot less dust, a little more horsepower, and several new safety features on these recycled race cars. The track is sprayed with water, after which a slow parade of vehicles packs down the surface. Unfortunately, in the process, the surface gets packed on the cars. Ed accepts the challenge of keeping his current car clean, just as he did with each of his previous white stock cars. Well, the first stock car race we ever seen, I was 17 and he was 15 and we found an old 38 Ford Coupe and cut the fenders off and went racing, didn't know one thing about it. Nearly 50 years of running around in circles has taught Ed a lot about racing, except perhaps when to quit. When his doctor advised him to stop competing because of a heart ailment, Ed found it hard to hit the brakes on his high-powered hobby. I enjoy it enough that a lot of times I get tired quick. I only make two or three laps, but I'm still here doing it. This 1959 honeymoon photo is another reflection of Ed's love for racing. It was taken on the way to a race the day after his wedding. My wife could have thought of a billion other things could have done except go to the races that day. On this day, Ed's car was less than picture perfect with a broken distributor. The spark in the heart of Old White number 79 is missing temporarily, so the next stop is a short stay in intensive care back at his shop. At this race, Ed's brother Bud is still roaring around the track. For 30 years, the two brothers worked closely building cars, and then at age 50, Bud felt driven to drive them. Well, it just gives the guys something to do and something to talk about, and gives the guy a thrill when you're out there. The competition, I guess that's what it's all about, is a competition. I've drove it for 14 years, and uh, it's been a good car. Won a lot of races with it. I guess I'll probably race till I can't crawl in them anymore. <laughs> Bud drives a 37 Ford with a six-cylinder engine, just one of the many antique racing classes. Others include several midget and sprint car categories. Rod Foster drives in the more powerful super modified class. The most interesting thing to me is that these old boys are still out there racing and going fast. It just blows my mind. They're 69 and 70 years old and uh, have had bypass surgery, have battled cancer, and uh, it's just neat to see these guys and it's an inspiration to me. It was also inspiring to see the parade lap treating the crowd to a nostalgic show of historic proportions. It's just the show. Uh, that's what makes it special for me, putting on a show. People uh, uh, do appreciate what we bring in. This is an awful lot of fun. It's even more fun when you take home a trophy. But that was a, that was a good race. This is a great track. My car really likes this track. And as if these guys who were raised on racing needed another reason to get revved up. It makes you feel good when you can go out and take your own piece of equipment that you've built yourself and go out and win a race, and that's what it's all about. As a young child growing up in Iowa City, Elizabeth Hill often went on walks at Hickory Hill Park. Now as a young woman, her territory has expanded to cover the whole state and her walks are enhanced by a deep awareness of the natural wonders around her. She certainly opened our eyes, and as we learned, she intends to open yours, too.
Away from the cars, away from the houses, the sirens, there's a whole other cast of creatures that are living their lives. And when you come into these places, you're invited into their home and you can find yourself feeling a part of it too. And that's such an important thing to feel, that you're connected to the place that you live. It's one of the, my favorite ways to spend a day, is just walking around, seeing what I can find. If you spend a moment and just stop, yeah. you know, and look at what's around you, you can see so much. So here is Petrillium, and they have these wonderful... Three leaves. Yeah. Exactly, three leaves. This is Dentaria, mm -hmm. and it grows in profusion along the trail. And we've got little blue violets. And what's the yellow? This is a, a little, another woodland violet that grows really tall, beautiful little fragile flowers. Some ferns. Ah. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. In the spring of 2004, Elizabeth Hill found a way to indulge in her favorite pastime and share it with others as well. That's when she left Washington State and came home to Iowa to begin the field work for a book on hiking in Iowa. My family is living here. We'll soon be leaving, so it was a, a wonderful time to come back and share their, their last few moments here and also learn about what I love and and why I love this place so much. The book, aptly titled Hiking Iowa, is a compendium of maps, pictures, directions, bits of cultural and natural history, contact information, and tips on camping and nearby attractions for many of Iowa's state forests and parks, county conservation board parks, and federal lands. 82 hikes are covered in the book, including the ones at this 300-acre Washington County Park along the Skunk River, known as Brinton Timber. In all my travels uh, last summer, I also went to all the parks and then went to all the local libraries and checked in with various local historians and ecologists, naturalists. Yeah. Kind of got pieced together all the information from different people, different sources. There's not a lot of literature, so I was, you know, forced to talk to people all the time about places, and that's where I learned so much of the of the information that's included in the book. There are six trails at Brinton Timber, and each is distinguished by different colored paint marks. At each of the junctures of the trails, there's a map that shows you where you are and how to get to all the other places in the park. So, so it's pretty hard to get lost. It's very hard to get lost indeed, yeah. Elizabeth is tuned in to the seasonal mosaic of sounds from the birds who visit this forest. During the winter, there'll be northern cardinals, um, tufted titmice, black-capped chickadees, a host of owls. And then during the summer, there's a huge influx of uh, migratory neotropical songbirds. Mm -hmm. So many different species of warblers, tanagers, gnat catchers. It's a, a real treat about May. Elizabeth's understanding of the inner workings of a forest community can help the hiker begin to see a rather uninspiring accumulation of water as a magical place of renewal. Now what's this over here? This is a little vernal pool. It's a little uh, indentation in the, this ridge top where water from the spring rain collects and serves as uh, breeding grounds for a few different frogs in the early spring. Uh, the chorus frogs and the spring peepers will usually lay their eggs here. Subtle treasures like the vernal pools can be found on each hike described in Elizabeth's book. But she was also quick to point out the striking attributes of her three favorite trails in the state. We start out uh, Lake Odessa. Part of it is the Mark Twain National Wildlife Refuge. There's so many wonderful birds that you can see flying along the Mississippi River corridor. Ada Hayden Prairie up in north central Iowa. It's the biggest black soil prairie remnant in Iowa. And it's such an incredible reminder of what Iowa once was. And then any site in the Less Hills where there's all these incredibly wonderful western plants that, that grow in Iowa, and the, the cacti and the yucca, things you wouldn't believe are here. All these county conservation board parks, the hundreds that there are, they are just wonderful places because there's so few people not a lot of facilities, so you don't have so much development, and they, they harbor a lot of very, very special organisms that people don't come to see very often. Organisms like these fungi flourishing on a fallen log. 
These are the turkey tail mushrooms that grow on rotting wood. They're the number one selling anti-cancer drug in Japan. Or her all-time favorite fungus, the artist's conch. On the other side, when, in the spring when it's wet, the, the spores are white, but they bruise brown if you touch them. So you can make a little picture that then when the spores dry, it, it bakes into the, to the mushroom. Elizabeth demonstrated her awareness of the secrets of the timber's understory by revealing them to us. Wild ginger right here. Underneath the little flowers hide down under the leaves. Take a look at the crimson color inside this jack of the pulpit. Here's the May apple in bloom. Brinton timber yielded another surprise for Elizabeth when she discovered that two sides of the park adjoin the farm of Carol Smith, niece of legendary conservationist and writer Aldo Leopold. Carol shares Elizabeth's love and respect for the natural world. I love the peace and quiet. I love the fact that it's kept just as a timber. Nothing is used off of it. If a tree dies, it falls down, rots down, and rejuvenates the soil. There's a place like that where people can go, and even if they're not after mushrooms, it's just a very perfect spot. Brinton timber is only one piece of the network of alluring wild places around the state. And Elizabeth hopes her book will inspire others to get walking and take the time to appreciate their beauty. Here you don't have to look very hard to see how beautiful it is. Um, but, you know, the, the gentle curve of the Iowa hills, the, the arc of the horizon, these are very, very subtle things that can be so, so monumentally beautiful. People don't, wouldn't see the grandeur in it normally, but if you just spend a little bit more time, maybe quiet down, slow down, then you are able to see how wonderful it is. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.